And we're back with the third chapter of Many Waters. We just got to find out what happened to Denny's. He and his unicorn ended up with some people who were trying to get a hold of the unicorn for some reason. Turned out that although they were able to get a mammoth to summon the unicorn, the girl that did that was not a virgin. The unicorn disappeared. Sandy got thrown in a dump. He is covered in feces. He runs out into the sand to clean himself off, throwing away all of his clothes. Kind of a baptism of fire scene, even though it does not make things better for him, it makes things worse. He has a terrible sunburn, just rubbed it full of sand. He calls the unicorn back after a long debate about whether or not it is real. The mammoth, who is um, much skinnier and sicklier than Higayon, helps him call the unicorn back. And Sandy is able to throw himself onto its back. And I believe we are back with Yalith at this part of the chapter. Let's see. Mala, Yalith's sister, betrothed to Ugliel. Yugiel, the Nephil, lay on a small rock ledge, ten minutes walk into the desert. Her heart beat rapidly with excitement. Yugiel had brought her to the rock, covered her with kisses, and then told her to wait until he returned with his brethren to seal their betrothal. She heard the beating of wings and looked up, catching her breath. Above her, a pelican, white against the night sky, flew in circles, which grew smaller as it descended. It touched the ground and raised its great wings until they seemed to brush the stars, and there was no longer a pelican in front of Mala, but a, but a seraph, with wings and hair streaming silver in the desert wind and eyes as bright as stars. Mala scrambled to her feet, letting her long black hair swirl about her, Alred! The seraph took her hand, looking down into her eyes. Are we really losing you? She withdrew her hands, dropping her gaze, laughing a small self-conscious laugh. With losing me? What do you mean? Is it true that you and Yugiel? Yes, it's true, she said proudly. Be happy for me, Alred. Yugiel is still your brother, is he not? Alred dropped to one knee so that he no longer towered over her. Yes, we are still brothers, though we have chosen very different ways. And you're sure yours is the better way? There was scorn in Mala's voice. Alred shook his head very sadly. We do not judge. The seraphim have chosen to stay close to the presence. But you're too close to be able to see it. The Nephilim have distance and objectivity. He looked at her, and her glance wavered for a moment. Yes, Yugiel told me that. Alred rose slowly to his full height. With one silver wing, he drew her briefly to him, and she smelled starlight. Then he let her go. You will not forget us. How can I forget you? She exclaimed. You have been my friend since Yalith took me to greet the dawn, and I met you in Ariel. You have not greeted the dawn lately. Oh, I am learning about the night. Alred bent down and kissed the top of her dark head. Then he walked slowly across the desert. Tears fell silently onto the sand. Mala looked down. When she raised her head, she saw a pelican flying up, up to be lost among the stars. Yalith hurried into her family tent. Mala is betrothed to one of the Nephilim. No one heeded her. Her parents, brothers and sisters-in-law were lying around on goatskins, eating and drinking eating and drinking wine her father had made from the early grapes. Several stone lamps lit the, lit the tent with a warm glow. Too warm, Yalith thought. Almost no breeze came through the open tent flap or the roof hole. The moon was descending, and only stars were visible. She looked around for Japheth, her favorite brother, but did not see him. Probably he was still out looking for the brother of the young giant in her grandfather's tent. Her mother was stirring something in a wooden bowl, intent on what she was doing. A mammoth, well-fed, with lustrously long hair on its flanks, lay sleeping at her feet. Someone had been sick, probably Ham, who had a weak stomach, and the smell of Ham's sickness mingled with the smell of wine, of meat from the stew pot, of the skins of the tent. Yalith was accustomed to all these odors, and noticed only that Ham was lying back on a pile of skins, looking pale. Ham was, in any event, the lightest-skinned member of the family, and the smallest, having been, according to 
Matrid, born with a full born a full moon early. Anna, his red haired wife, knelt by him, offering him wine. Languidly he pushed it away, then pulled Anna down to him, kissing her full sensual mouth. Yalith went up to Matrid, her mother, repeated, Mala is betrothed, Matrid looked up briefly. She's not old enough. Oh, mother, of course she is, and she is. Old enough? Matrid was preoccupied with what she was doing. Betrothed? Who is it this time? It's not one of us, it's one of the Nephilim. Matrid shivered, but went on stirring without focus. Mala has changed. She is no longer my merry little girl who is satisfied to see a butterfly or a drop of dew on a spider's web. She is no longer satisfied to be with us in the home tent. A tear dropped into the bowl. Yalith patted her mother's arm. She's grown up, mother. So have you, but you don't go chasing about the oasis at night. You don't run after the Nephilim. Maybe the Nephil ran after her. She's pretty enough. But it is not right for me to hear something like this second hand. That is not how things are done. That is not how my daughter behaves. I'm sorry, Yalith said uncomfortably. I was walking home from Grandfather Lamex, and I saw them. Mala and the Nephil. His name is Yugiel. He asked me to tell you so that you would not be worried. Worried? Matrid exclaimed. Just don't tell your father, that's all. What's to prevent this ug... Ugiel. Yugiel. This Nephil from coming himself with Mala to tell me and your father according to the custom. Yalith frowned worriedly. He said that times are changing. Eblis had said that, too. She felt a jolt of insecurity in the pit of her stomach. She did not tell her mother about Eblis. Matrid put down her wooden spoon with a bang. There are many who think it is an honor to be noticed by a Nephil and accept their ways. Anna, Matrid looked across at her son Ham's wife, red-headed, still luscious, but beginning to be overblown. Anna tells me that her younger sister Tigla is being singled out by a Nephil for marriage. Anna is thrilled, but you're not. Tigla is not my daughter. Mala is, Matrid turned away. Children are not children. I am not star child. I am not star dazzled by the Nephilim. They are very different from us. They are beautiful. Beautiful, yes, but they will make changes, and not all changes are good. I don't want things to change, Yalith thought. And then, in her mind's eye, she saw again the young giant who had bowed to her in Grandfather Lamech's tent, and who was unlike anybody she had ever seen. Matrid continued, Change is, I suppose, inevitable, and sometimes it brings good things. She looked across the tent at her oldest son, Shem, who was sitting with his wife, Elisheba, eating some of the grapes from the, vine from the vineyard, which were not pressed for wine but kept for the table. Shem was pulling one grape at a time from the bunch and throwing it at Elisheba. She would catch each grape in her open mouth, and they would both laugh with pleasure at this simple, sensual game. It seemed amazingly young and romantic for this stocky, stolid couple. Elisheba is a great help to me, and then Japheth's wife. Yalith looked to where a young woman with soft, curling black hair against creamy skin was scouring a wooden bowl with sand. The young woman looked up and waved in greeting. Matrid said, She comes to us from another oasis and with a strange name. Oh, holy Bama, Yalith sounded it out. Look at her, Matrid commanded. Yalith looked at her sister-in-law. Oh, holy Bama was fairer by complexion than Yalith, or the other women. Even fairer than Ham, her hair and brows were blacker than the night sky, a rippling purpley black. When Oholi Bama stood, she was nearly a head taller than the other women, and beautiful. She always seemed lit by moonlight. Yalith thought, What about her? she asked her mother. Look at her, child! Look at her! Yalith was shocked. You mean, you think that she... She is the youngest daughter of a very old... Ma uh, Matrid shrugged slightly. She is the youngest daughter of a very old man. She held up the fingers of both hands. More than ten years younger... And her brothers and sisters. I love Oholi Bama as though she were my own, and if Oholi Bama was indeed sired by a Nephil, then great good has been brought into our lives. Yalith looked at Oholi Bama as though seeing her for the, 
for the first time. After Yalith and Mala, Oholibama was the youngest woman in the tent, younger by several years than Elisheba, Shem's wife, or Anna, Ham's wife. All three of Yalith's brothers had married at unusually young ages, and all three had grumbled at having to take on domestic duties so soon. Shem had protested, But we are too young to marry! I am the oldest, and I have barely reached my first hundred years! His father had replied, There is a certain urgency, my son. Why? And how will you find wives for us when we are so young? You are fine-looking men, the patriarch assured him. Ham had joined in. But why the rush, father? What is this urgency you speak of? The patriarch pulled at his long beard, which was beginning to show white. Yesterday, when I was working in the vineyard, the voice spoke to me. El told me that I must find wives for you. But why? Ham protested. We're young and we need time. There are changes, great changes to come, the patriarch said. Is the volcano going to erupt? Shem asked. If the volcano, or if the volcano erupts, Ham said, wives won't do us any good. Their father told them only that the word of El had come to him in the vineyard, and that El had given no explanation. Elisheba and Anna were easily found for Shem and Ham. The patriarch had a reputation as an honest man. He had the largest and best vineyards on the oasis and fine flocks of goats and sheep. The fame of his wine had spread to many other oases round about. Matred was a woman of unquestionable virtue and beauty, and her girth attested to her skills as a cook. It was a privilege to marry into her tent. Japheth was young enough so that no one stepped forward. His face was still smooth and beardless. His body hair was no more than soft down. His eyes were friendly and guileless. But he was on the threshold of manhood. His father went off on his camel one day and came back with a holy bama. Japheth had been at the well getting water for the animals when he saw a young girl on a white camel, a young girl of fair complexion, with dark hair tumbling richly against her ivory shoulders. His eyes met a holy bama's dark eyes, met Oholibama's eyes, dark as the night sky between stars, and his knees became fluid. She slid off the white camel's back and came toward him. Slender hands were outstretched. Their love was a bright flower, youthful and radiantly beautiful. Oholibama. Oholibama. A name as strange as her moonlit beauty, but soon it flowed easily from their lips. Oholibama was Yala's first real friend, they were not far apart in age, both of them barely out of childhood and into womanhood. They were alike, too, and in their likeness to the others. They were alike, too, in their unlikeness to the others. They saw and rejoiced in what most people in the, of the Oasis never noticed. Both liked to leave the tent at first dawn and watch and wait for the sun to rise over the desert, delighting in the calling of the stars just before daylight. It was during one of her dawn walks that Yalith had met the great lion, who was the Seraph Ar Ariel. And on another walk, which she had persuaded Mala to join her, that she had introduced to Ariel and Alred and Alarid, the pelican, to her sister. But once Oholibama came, Mala preferred to sleep in the morning. So Yalith and her younger sister and her youngest sister-in-law would slip out quietly when the great red disk of day pulled above the white sand, and the stars dimmed, and their songs faded faded out. Scarab beetles, who had slept under the sand during the hours of the dark, came scuttling up into the light. At the edge of the oasis, the baboons leapt from the trees, clapping their hands and shrieking for joy at the risking of the sun, at the rising of the sun. Behind them on the oasis, the cocks crowed, and in the desert... The lions roared their early morning roar before retreating to their caves to sleep during the heat of the day. Yalith and Oholibama shared a silent and joyful companionship. And we will pause there. <laughs>